Hey guys, how is it going? It's Adam. Welcome to the Vintage Sanctuary. So yesterday I was listening, watching a John Mangini video and he graciously gave a shout out to my channel, also to a channel called The Drew, Drew and also to Double D Vintage Cards. And so I was so inspired by that, I said, hey, I should put on a fresh tank top and make a video. And also, I only have a few pre-war cards, but I thought I'm going to show a video with a pre-war card. So we're going to be looking at Yankees contributor Earl Combs. And I have one card of his that's post-war, post-World War II, and one that's pre-war. We'll look at the post-war first, and then in honor of John Mangini, we'll look at the pre-war. However, I must say, John, I'm a little disappointed because, see, John's latest video from, from today, the day I'm recording this, he shows the, the uh, briefcase or special money case full of money that he's bringing to the National. And, you know, I'm not disclosing anything. He's the one that showed it on his channel, so you might want to check that video out. And I got to thinking, you know, I think the dealers are bringing the same amount of memorabilia and cards. But when John brings that briefcase full of money, that's going to be more money chasing those cards. So that's going to lead to some level of inflation and higher prices for the cards that, that I'm trying to obtain there and, and other collectors are trying to obtain as well. So, you know, I just want you to give that some thought, John. I guess it's not too late for you to change your mind, but if you decide to bring that entire briefcase full of the money that you had planned, uh, you know, that is uh, more demand in terms of dollars chasing the limited supply at the national, and, and that will affect all of us. So I hope you'll keep that in, in mind. Okay, let me turn this camera around and uh, let you look at the post-war card of Earl Combs, Yankees Dynasty contributor. And then I'll say some things about Earl, and then we'll go on to his pre-war card. So this is his 1954 Tops, his first Tops card, when he was a coach for the Philadelphia Phillies. I'm a huge fan of 1954 Tops. I hope someday to complete all of the Hall of Famers and then uh, some of the stars that I like and Yankee contributors like Earl Combs here. So I was happy to pick this one up. I think I was the only bidder. It had a reasonable starting bid for the auction, I thought, for, for such a nice card. And uh, I bid more than that minimum because I, I really wanted this card. But I'm, as I recall, I think I was the only, only bidder on this one. So it's kind of nice. I was only competing with the seller's uh, minimum required bid. All right, some thoughts about Earl Combs. Well, he played for the Yankees from 1924 to 1935. When he was chasing a ball in the outfield during a game in 1934, he fractured his skull. And, uh, you know, that was pretty serious. But he did come back in 35, and then that ended up being his last year as a player. And then he coached for roughly a couple of decades. And this was the end of his coaching was in 1954 when he coached for the Philadelphia Phillies. So that means that Earl Combs was there for, you know, the really successful Yankees teams of the 20s and then into the 30s. And obviously, uh, he was overshadowed by uh, some teammates of note, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, to mention a couple. However, uh, Combs was held in high regard by those in, in the game in his own right. Uh, he played center field. He was the leadoff hitter, and it seemed like he always got on base. Well, not always, of course, but he was really good at getting on base, and then he set the table for Ruth and Gehrig and the others on Murderer's Row that would hit, you know, that would hit him around the base paths. However, uh, he was a great hitter himself as well. He had a 325 lifetime batting average. And then in the four World Series that he played in, he had a 350 uh, World Series batting average. So he was a line drive hitter, a ball hawk in center field, and a speed demon in the field and on the bases. So he was fast. He was fast when he was running bases, and he was 
uh, fast when he was out there chasing fly balls or line drives in the field. When we think about 1927, the 1927 Yankees, that's the team that many consider to be the best team ever in baseball history. Well, that year, talk about an outfield. Bob Musil from the outfield hit 337. Babe Ruth hit 356, and that was the year 1927 he had the 60 home runs. However, that year, Combs also hit 356. And not only that, but Combs led the American League in 1927 with 231 hits. In fact, there were three times that Combs uh, had over 200 hits. And uh, I think his speed was showcased by the fact that he led the league in triples three different times. And to speak to his feeling, uh, his fielding, he led the American League um, outfielders in putouts twice. Speaking of his speed, uh, when he got to the Yankees, he said to manager Miller Huggins that they called him the mail carrier. That is that people called Earl Combs the mail carrier, which is a reference to him being able to steal bases because of his speed. However, Without missing a beat, Huggins said, we'll call you the waiter. When you get on first base, you just wait there for Ruth or Gehrig or one of the other fellows to send you uh, the rest of the way around by hitting, of course. So pretty amazing uh, player, Earl Combs. He is uh, a member of the Hall of Fame. Babe Ruth had this to say about Combs. Combs was more than a grand ball player. He was always a first class gentleman. No one ever accused him of being out on a drinking party, and you'd laugh at the words he used for cussing. Often he'd sit in his room and read the Bible, for he came from a strict mountaineering family. But Earl was all man and a great competitor. So I came across this card that we are looking at right now, this 1954 Topps card, back in April. And it is just a stunner. Notice if you look from here, does it look off center? Well, it doesn't to me because who could ever tell? I guess when you get though to where his uh, uniform top is, then you can kind of tell what the centering is. So this card is not perfectly centered by any means, but you know, in my humble opinion, it hardly makes a difference. But other than that, talk about sharp and clean and fresh like it just came out of the pack. I am such a fan of the backs of 54 Tops as well. I, there's something about this rich green color on the backs, the color combination here, the green and the red, that is just super appealing to me. Notice the cartoons on this one speak to his uh, big injury. I'm going to go ahead and read. On July 24, 1934, it was 120 degrees in the Yankee dugout. Fatigued by the heat, Combs crashed into a wall chasing a fly. He fractured his skull and was near death. Out of baseball that season, he was back in 35, hit 282. And 35 was his last year uh, as a player. All right, well, are you ready for the big reveal? This is one of my very few uh, pre-war cards. And I was combing the internet, pun intended, back in March of 2021, basically just, you know, seeing what was out there. And I came across this reasonably priced Buy It Now Beauty, and I snatched it up. Are you ready? Here it comes. This is a 1931 W517, and I think the W stands for a uh, strip card. These cards came in strips. It was hand cut. Notice that number one. That number one was drawn by hand, and then the circle around the one was drawn by hand as well. And you can even tell uh, his name and league and team were drawn by hand as well. But this is just gorgeous. It's an SGC 2.5. Uh, these came in different tones, most notably sepia, but this looks, I guess it could be the blue tone. It almost seems like a licorice uh, black to me, but it's such a gorgeous, rich color. And then the cardstock itself is a kind of a heavy, uh, creamy cardstock, which I really like. Notice you can see some of the 
darker color on back. Maybe this was, you know, laying on top of, maybe that's from the front, or maybe this was laying on top of another strip shortly after it was printed, and so uh, some of the ink was absorbed by the back. But these are kind of special, these W517s, because they are three inches by four inches, and most of the strip cards were much smaller. Uh, not only that, but um, this is an actual photograph, and most of the strip cards did not have actual photographs. So I think this is just a really cool card to get, and it's a low pop card. I don't know how many are out there in the raw, but there aren't that many that are graded. And I think it's kind of cool when you look into the, the, I guess, the front row, it almost looks like those are wooden seats behind that sort of wall barrier there. But what a gorgeous, uh, beautiful card. So I'm so happy to have this one in my collection. Uh, these strip cards, as I understand it, so, you know, people would go to shop maybe at the candy store or at the grocery store. And then the clerk or the sto store owner would cut out a strip card. Maybe it would go to the kids, you know? So maybe the kids would be like, hey, mom, or hey, dad, let's go shop at that grocery store, or let's go get some candy there. Some of those kids wanted the cards. And so this could have been cut by the store owner or cut off the strip by a clerk, or it's possible the kids were given a strip and then they cut them out. And, and I think that leads to an awful lot of... Um, Authentics because of the hand cut, but this one got a numerical grade of 2.5. So apparently they felt like it had enough border and, and no other issues. So, you know, that would limit, would keep it from getting a numerical grade. So I think, you know, what a cool piece of, of uh, Americana. What a, what a gorgeous card. Well, as King Henry VIII said to, uh, pretty much all of his wives, I really shouldn't keep you too long. So I hope you had a wonderful and peaceful time in the Vintage Sanctuary. <laughs>